How many of you had a hard hat on last time when you were operating saw? Everybody I see. Why would you need to have a hard hat on when you're when you're working with a chainsaw? In other words, something come out of a tree, a tree goes the wrong way. It could be something on the ground too that flops up something <coughs> or whatever. And did you know that the number one injury, now there are a lot of cuts and lacerations that happen from chainsaws, but the number one injury with saws is what they call struck bias. That's where most of the quadriplegics, paraplegics, and fatalities come in. Is that a limb comes down, a tree goes the wrong way, whatever, it's usually a blow to the head or upper body. So when we start to, to look through that, a hard hat's just good common sense. One guy did sum it up pretty well. He said, if you don't have anything to protect, you don't need one, right? Hopefully we all do. Yeah, uh, you know stuff on it. Uh, I, I had one guy had a helmet on, and it, it, it caught the brim of the hat and mm -hmm. stopped that close to him on a kickback. Yeah. And we'll talk about some reactive courses. But you know, I also start talking to people and and talk about OSHA requirements. That's really where the the standards came about back in the mid '90s for logging. Uh, OSHA came out with some new regulations because logging was deemed to be one of the most dangerous occupations. Although it's the same techniques and same situations you get into whether you're cutting firewood or cleaning up after a storm. But uh, a lot of times it can be shut down and they usually don't find stuff back and forth. But I always tell people I, I really don't care what the rules are. That's beside the point. What we need to understand is why are the rules there? In other words, why is a hard hat in that list of PPE? Well, so many times people got hit in the head, they said, well, maybe this could help to keep injuries from taking place, right? And there's other things when we look at this list of stuff that, that comes in on the standard for a reason. So hard hat is one of them. The next one is, is looking at face protection. It's not really part for the chainsaw, but it is if you're pulling brush or you have a situation feeding a chipper, face protection is sometimes required in the workplace. So. Screen like this can help to deflect limbs and stuff away from your face and also help to protect your eyes. Underneath, and I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not, but how many of you ever heard of the ANSI Z87 standard? In other words, eye protection is, is you know, kind of tested to make sure that it's going to meet the impact and resistance and stuff that you need. And uh, for years, I always talked about in your planning process, you really have to think about, I, I need a dark pair and a clear pair. Because day like today, it's nice to have the shade, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But if you have to get out there in a the storm or at night, 2 o'clock in the morning, if, if you've got this and you don't have these, then they have to stay on your hat or on your truck dash, don't you? Because you can't use them. So you kind of have to plan ahead so that you have eye protection in all situations. And they're fairly inexpensive. But uh, what makes them safety glasses is the ANSI test, the Z87. And um, back years ago, I was, I was down in Orlando, and I was doing a, a thing for the International Safety Council, basically talking through, this manufacturer brought me down, they do PPE, and they manufacture safety glasses. And I did a little talk, and then I went around to the vendor area, and there's a lot of people in there selling safety glasses. They had posters up, meet Z87.1, and all the new styles and stuff. And I went back over to Fred, who's the vice president of the company, and I uh, went back over to his booth, and I, I said, man, there's a lot of people selling glasses. He said, yeah, I need to get around and talk to some of them, because we produce for a lot of them. And I said, there's a bunch. They all had the posters up, Z87. He said, well, you know what that is, don't you? I said, yeah, I've read through it. He said, let me show you something. He went over to his bag, and he came out with this pair of glasses. And uh, what it is is they have a, a, a test they go through. They have, to, they have to have an impact for the frames. And then they, they, they do a little test to keep the, the lenses, make sure they'll meet the impact. And uh, over here on the left side, what they do is they shoot out a BB at about 150 feet per second, and it can't shatter the lens. But what he was showing me is this one came back from the military test. This is a 22 caliber pellet shot out of an air rifle at 650 feet per second. And that's what the military required for shrapnel and, and different things. And you know, he said, you know, you hit that nail or you got a rock flies out of a mower or whatever. So we tend to go on the high side of it and, and uh, try to make a match for the military. I said, well, it absorbs. He said, yeah, if it doesn't absorb it, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to shatter. So what you got to think about is if you're out there, especially with no eye protection on, you know, if something goes in your eye, you, you lose your sight very quickly. But then the other thing is that regular glasses, whether it be glass lenses or thin polycarbonates, is that if it hits, it's going to shatter and it can go into your face. And the frames aren't designed to take the impact either. So that's the reason why you should always look for that Z87 when you when you pick up glasses, hopefully to protect your eyes. Now this afternoon when we got the trees. I, I've, I've got you know I've got them at Walmart. They're not cheap, but they're they're prescription glasses I had made, and so you can get those, or you can have over glasses uh, to go over your prescription glasses. 
but it's important that you uh, have something that'll take the impact when you're out there working with stuff like chainsaws and some other equipment. So uh, that's the ANSI Z87. And the other thing that's on these systems, and you don't have to have a whole helmet system like this, but you could have plugs or muffs that goes along with it, is when you start working around equipment with loud noise, it's protecting the hearing that you have. And uh, so plugs or muffs like this. When the standards came out in 94, Sorn and I were up in Kingsport, Tennessee, and uh, we were doing a thing for the Tennessee Valley Authority and for Mead Paper Company. They had a group of loggers up there. Sorn was going to take half the group out in the woods to talk about the cutting, and I was talking, going over the new regulations with the hearing, uh, with the PPE. And uh, I started off and basically the same presentation, got up to the ears, and this one guy said, I don't know why they're getting involved in our business. He said, you know, they don't even understand. He said, I'm not going to put plugs or muffs on my people. He said, they don't listen to me now half the time. He said, if I put that stuff on there, they can't hear limbs falling, trees, and hear equipment coming, all this kind of stuff. He said, it's dangerous. You don't need to plug up somebody's ear. And I said, well, you know, in my shop, I found out when there was a lot of noise when they run the saws and mowers, I could hear better through them sometimes with plugs. The other guy stood up, oh, that's a bunch of bull, you know, that, that, they're just trying to get in our business. All I said, look, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just trying to tell you what the rules are now. But I said, let's take a little break. Getting kind of mutinous. And at the break, this guy come up to me. And he said, uh, they don't understand tinnitus, do they? I heard what they said. And I'd heard the term, but I didn't know how to explain it. Some tinnitus. Tinnitus, tinnitus, eye tinnitus, some people call it. But it, uh, it's a ringing or distortion that starts in your ear from being exposed to noise. Yeah. Come to find out, this guy's an eye, ear, nose, and throat doctor down in Kingsport. His son graduated from high school and was going to work with his brother-in-law who had a logging operation. And he said, I cut a lot of firewood, so I decided to bring him up here and come up here with him and sit through the class. And he said, I heard what they said. And he said, one little story I use to tell people about tinnitus and stuff, so it might help you in the future. And he went on to tell me, he said, you go out here this afternoon and get in your car or your truck. Got your radio playing, sounding good. He said, you drive home, go inside, get a good night's rest, come back out tomorrow morning, crank up your vehicle. What's the first thing you reach over to do? Turn the radio down. Turn the radio down. Sounded good this afternoon, tomorrow morning, blast you to the back seat. He said, that's tinnitus. He said, throughout the day, our ears start shutting down to noises. Mm -hmm. And he said, when we get rest, some of it comes back. But if we stay exposed to loud noises too long, mm -hmm. then it starts to give permanent hearing damage. It doesn't come back. And you hear it and ringing louder than anybody else. It gets ringing and ringing and ringing. I can vouch for that playing heavy metal through Marshall Hemp for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I so, told my wife one night in the bedroom, I said, there's some noises in here. Where is it at? Yeah. She said, there's yeah. not any in there. It was me. Yeah. Well, you know, doctors tell us that you have to keep it below about 85 to 90 decibels around the noise area to your ears. And chainsaws run 90 to 130. So anytime you're operating a chainsaw, you know, it starts in the same thing. You can have equipment, uh, you know, mowers, trimmers, all that kind of stuff. A lot of the diesel power engines, they're all higher than that. So you really have to think about when you get ready to retire, you not only want to be able to watch the fish, you want to be able to hear them. So, you know, it's something where you do it. And, and uh, you know, if you use plugs and muffs, you can hear better through it many times. You just have to kind of get used to them. I have a hard time with plugs because they irritate my ears, but the muffs I, I've used for years and it, it tends to help. I probably have some hearing loss anyway, but everybody does, but you want to keep what you have. That's a big thing. So that's the head, eye, and ear portion of it. Try to keep young people around me so they can hear for me when I'm in the room. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Holler at me. Mm -hmm. Next thing on down, and uh, uh, this is something of uh, mm -hmm. uh, visibility. I don't know what the best color is. You know, we think about the high vis stuff, and there are some rules and regulations on that with different work that you do. But uh, I don't know, one guy down in Mississippi one time, a log job, he, he said, the best thing you can have on out here in the woods is camouflage. Yeah, I said, how do you figure that to be a safety cover? He said, they can't hit you with a tree if they can't see you. I thought that's pretty sharp. <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of truth to that, isn't there? Yep. It's not the color that we're wearing, it's what we're looking. It's like you guys told the guys from, from Fuller yesterday, I mean, y'all all have the same, I don't know whether it's gray or brownish or whatever it is there, but uh, if you got that same gray shirt on, you know what your team looks like, right? And so that's what you spot. And so whether everybody had a different color, you look to be able to itemize where they're at because a lot of the instances say, I didn't know they were there. And so you want to make sure that you have a snapshot of what your team looks like. And if somebody else comes through it, then you can be able to try to slow down the progress there. But uh, there are some garments like this. There's a lot of slips, trips, and falls that happen. So Husqvarna's got one, Steel's got one, this kind of thing. Gives some upper body protection if you're in heavy brush or climbing, that kind of stuff. And uh, but probably the biggest thing here is the, the visibility. So oranges or reds or yellows or something that, that kind of is able to pick out. And then uh, on down uh, another, I didn't put things out here. 
the uh, hand protection, wearing gloves. Mm -hmm. and, and when the standards came out in 94, they didn't list gloves as a requirement for, for chainsaw operation. And um, a lot of the loggers didn't, didn't like to wear them because they were, they were really bulky. And so different companies had some type of material stuff on them. And so OSHA didn't put it in the standard, but then they, they said, well, if you're sharpening chain, it falls under the standard because that's under the sharp standard. So if you've got potential for lacerations, you have to cover your hands. But then they came back a year or two later and they, they said, well, actually, whatever is in the operator's manual. How many of you, have anybody read an operator's manual on chainsaw? Everybody I see. So when you, you start to look, nobody reads them. And they said if it's in the list of PPE in the operator's manual, then it automatically goes under general industry. And I don't know of a single chainsaw operator's manual that doesn't list gloves and hard hat and all that kind of stuff as far as the PPE suggestions. <coughs> so they came back and, and stated that. Well, Soren had me started with them years ago, and when we were over in Europe, um, I, I had a guy, I said, why do you guys use mittens? He said, well, because your fingers aren't designed to grip with them apart. Like if you take gloves that have a lot of material between, that's the reason why a lot of people don't like them, it fatigues your hands and stuff. If, if you can keep your fingers closer together, you can keep a better grip and less fatigue. And so you can just separate and press, put your fingers together, you can, you can see it's quite often. So I use mittens, Soren got me started on those. But if you've got, uh, you know, gloves that, that fit you correctly, and, and you around chainsaws and stuff it gives you a little bit of resistance but basically you know briars and all kinds of stuff that get with you so you want to make sure that you think about uh, and over the years the number one cut area laceration area is the left hand and if people take a hand off the saw to grab something or hold something or hold it on and cut and this kind of stuff and uh, so and it has passed though it's now the left leg and the right leg and now the hand i think the hand guards on the saws have to reduce some of it or maybe more people understanding about keeping their hands on the saws but it's, it's something where the left hand over the years was the number one cut area for many many years <laughs> you, did you get cut in the hands so <laughs> next thing paying attention deals yeah at night in a boat in a boat all right, I won't go there right now. But anyhow, next thing on down has to do with legs. And uh, how many of you have chainsaws that you know of and, and more or less you know where the chaps are? Because uh, like I say, it's now moved left leg being number one. But this, uh, this is a pair of apron style chaps, they call them. And a couple things to look for to make sure they are. And that's a UL classification that lets you know they've been tested. And uh, more or less, uh, all these chaps work off what we call jamming. When the chainsaw hits it, it, it pulls the fibers out, they wrap around the chain bar and sprocket and start to choke it down. And uh, this particular pair right here, I took a steel 361, wide open, 13,600 RPM. I put it around the log because I have a hard time finding volunteers for this. <laughs> but uh, I took the saw wide open into it and it stopped it within two layers and it didn't cut through at all. And I have had some that, that cut through a little bit. They're not designed to be cut proof necessarily, but they are hopefully tested to resist the cut throughs. And uh, that material, OSHA specifies it being out of a ballistic nylon. That would be something used in body armor, bulletproof vests, that type of stuff. Um, usually people think about Kevlar, which is a yellow or goldish color. Uh, there's a few manufacturers that use that. But the majority of the chainsaw ones that you see from those manufacturers, it's usually a white, but it is a ballistic nylon. And it's, uh, it's usually, um, uh, like this one's called Prolar. Uh, Ingetex is a manufacturer, still uses Avitec. So there's, there's different ones, but they're all ballistic nylons. And so that's, a, that's the issue there. You wanna make sure the, uh, the buckles and everything are in good shape because what happens a lot of times, a chainsaw will grab it and it pulls it around. So you wanna make sure all the buckles are buckled and you want them kind of snug so they can't get around. The pants that I have on actually have the same pads in it. So if you do a lot of chainsawing, it makes it a little bit more comfortable. But uh, for your type of work, usually taking the chaps off and on is, is pretty, pretty nice to have actually. Lengthwise, they should go from your waist down to the tops of your boots. And so when you look at it, a lot of people ask, well, what size do I need to pick up? You know, well, most of your pants are sized by the inseam. So if you wear 32 length pants, they're usually the inseam length is 32 inches. Chaps, for some reason, are sized by the outer seam. So more or less, so you add four inches to it, and that'll usually make it pretty good. So if you wear 32 pants, 36 inch chaps would be what you pull out of the box. So that's kind of it. And the other thing is you want to make sure that you keep them as dry and clean as possible. Um, 
I had a young fella, I, I saw these back years ago on a job, and, and this guy used them every day, and they were filthy. And I said, I wonder if they'll work. <laughs> and so I traded him out a pair and took his chainsaw and put him around a log. And you see, it didn't do quite as good a job. But I took them home and washed them on a pillowcase about three or four times, and, and, and you can see they're still discolored. And my theory was, what happens when they get so dirty? Well, what happens is it mats down the fibers. And so if you hit it with a chainsaw, it pulls fibers out, they're not going to work next time. And then if they're too dirty, it just it can't pull them out, so it just allows the chainsaw to cut through it. So you want to make sure you keep them as clean and dry as possible. And some of them are hand washed, some of them machine washed, some of them hang up to dry, some of them low temp dry. So you have to kind of read the directions on the care instructions. But the biggest thing is, as an operator, try to keep them as clean and dry and everything in good shape as possible. So that's a head, eye and ear, gloves if necessary, leg protection, all of that shall be supplied for you. So in other words, somewhere uh, in the room, you know, there's, there's some type of uh, PPE for the chainsaw operation. So if you get called out on a storm or something like that, uh, you know, you, you've got it available for you. You just have to make sure that you, you find it and put it on. The kind of gray area is foot. Uh, they do specify that you use good heavy duty boots. If you're out there operating saw and lightweight sneakers or hiking boots, they don't offer a, a lot of cut resistance, but the biggest thing is puncture wounds and stuff on storm cleanups, uh, where sticks are broken sharp or nails on boards or whatever it is. So you wanna make sure that you've got some, some pretty heavy duty boots, good traction, some ankle support, maybe a little water resistance. Those are usually the financial responsibility of the employee. So that's, that's not part of what's necessarily supplied for you. So you wanna make sure you kind of keep your stuff together too. But that's uh that's PPE. Any questions? How long does the material last on the chaps? As far as life, what you know? Yeah, there, there's shelf really life, there's really not a shelf life of it. Uh, just, the only thing that really bothers them much is heat. You know, if you get close to a fire or something like that, um, you want to just keep them as, as clean as possible. Most of it is nylon, polyester nylon. It's not really affected by you know wear as far as that goes, but. Keeping everything in good shape on it. They call it housekeeping, just keeping them clean and all the above. Clean and dry. So uh, some of them are like, you know, they're machine washable, you just have to look steel. Even uh, if you look at their new chaps, when you, if you read the material with it, it says they recommend you to wash and dry them before you actually use them the first time. So it kind of fluffs up the fibers and does that. So, But there's different, different uh, cleaning suggestions, so you got to make sure that you look at the labels. One last little story here, and we'll we'll take a little break. I'm on. We'll take a break about every 45 minutes or so, give you some time to catch up on stuff, restrooms, whatever. But uh, I think this kind of sets the tone on on PPE and the reason for it. This uh, particular pair right here, I, one of our game of logging programs, I had going up in the Wise, Virginia. It's kind of steep terrain, and uh, we had gone through day one, two, and three, which we go about a month in between for to practice. But get, we're back for day four, and the young fellow met me there at the truck and pulled in. He said, uh, I got some great trees for today's class. He said, kind of up on a flat, but it's kind of steep to get up there. But guys don't like it. It's a big poplar tree. And I said, that's great. And uh, he said, I, I really want to finish the class. He said, I don't know if I can get up there today. I said, what's the matter? He said, well, I hurt my leg since the last class. I said, you hurt your leg? He said, yeah, I cut it with a chainsaw. I said, you cut it with a saw? Did you have your chaps on? He said, well, I did. I want to talk to you about that. And he went over his truck and came back with this pair of chaps. And he started telling me the story is Friday working on the backside of the mountaintop and uh, they took him back up there Monday morning about seven o'clock he got his saw ready to go got all dressed in his PPE and he dropped a big poplar tree went over and started to take the limbs off of it as he started to cut the limbs the log started to roll he didn't have a good stance he basically jerked his saw back he fell backwards and the chainsaw came back into the inside of his left thigh right here and this is the pair of chaps he had on he went on to tell me it was about 45 minutes by the time the skidder got back up there and they put him on there and they got him down. They finally got cell service. They called the sheriff's department. The sheriff's department got a hold of the hospital. They sent out a helicopter to pick him up. And he said, the doctor that set me up said I was very fortunate though. He said I was about three eighths of an inch from hitting my femoral artery running up my left leg. He said, son, if you'd have went that much deeper, you'd have probably stayed on that mountaintop that morning. And, uh, you know, I, I probably say this a couple times that I believe the majority of cuts that happen are not as much from the reactive forces of the saw, and we're going to talk about that, as it is our reaction to its action. That sounds complicated, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. 
So if you take and you start to cut this limb or this log and it starts to grab your saw, what's your reaction? You go jerk it out, you don't want it stuck. And that's basically what he did. He, he went up there and he jerked the saw back, didn't have a good stance, fell backwards, and the saw still turned and came into the inside of his leg here. He had a big saw too. He had a steel 064 at that time. And um, so I, you know, he asked me, he said, Tim, I think they ought to really make these things work better. And I said, well, you, you hit right at the corner of the pad, there wasn't a whole lot of material you could pull out. But I said, what, what makes you think they didn't work? He said, well, I still got 52 stitches. I said, yeah, what makes you think they didn't work? Kind of picking on it a little bit. He said, the 52 stitches. I said, well, let me ask you this. What might have happened if you hadn't put those on that morning? He looked at me kind of blank. He said, oh, I see what you're saying. He said, here, take these. Maybe you can show somebody else. Because I guess maybe they did save my life, didn't they? And we don't know, do we? I mean, we don't know whether the seatbelt works or the hard hat or the chaps or boots or whatever works. But we do know something. It can't work if we don't do what? Put them on. You know, the safety glasses or the hard hat or the chaps, they have to be on to work. And hopefully, uh, and they're not really designed to prevent the incident, but hopefully they're going to lessen the Mike injury. Mike Earnhardt said the junior day of the race, <laughs> you and Mike wore the highest device, I'm not putting one on. Yeah. Didn't, didn't, work, one didn't on. work so good, did it? <laughs> what happened on yours? You cut your hand? Yeah, I was in the creek one night trying to go up the creek. And I was cutting my way up through it. And yeah. I cut a limb off. And I, don't know, I undoubtedly grabbed hold to it and set the saw to brace myself or whatever, and it was barely turning, but still turning, and I set it that way. So you had one hand on the saw and one hand holding it. You know, they don't make one handed chainsaws. <laughs> <laughs> and all I had to move was a nasty rag that probably been in there over a bunch of fish and well, that's there so bad. It was, crusty, nothing, though. it was crusty, and then when I got to where my Ma-in-law was that she had a fit. I've asked a lot of people this question. I did question. Pass it up with a clean rag after I got to her. I've asked a lot of people this question. Are you gonna be honest? <clears throat> did you plan it? Nope. No. So it was an unplanned event, wasn't it? You know, as far I, as that part was. I've asked. And you hundreds, were gonna have to cut my way into them. Uh, I've asked hundreds of people. You know, I've asked is that with anybody injured. There's always a hand or two that goes up about every class. <clears throat> but it's something I've only had one person tell me over the years that they planned it. <laughs> I was down in Alabama, down below Auburn, and they were doing a thing at a, the <coughs> Alabama uh, Extension Service, wanted to do some chainsaw training. And most of it was loggers in the room. And I asked the question, anybody here been injured with a saw? And there were about 10 or 15 hands went up. And uh, I asked the first one, I said, what happened on yours? Well, I was running a bow saw, and it, it kicked back, and he had a scar there where he hit on his hand. Another guy was trimming brush and hit his left knee. And then another guy cut the top of his right foot. And I quit asking after that, you know. But I asked the guy with the hand, I said, you plan it? He said, oh no, it was an accident. The guy with the knee, oh no. Got to the guy with the foot. He said, well, I, I guess I did plan it. I said, you plan to cut your foot? He said, yeah. He said, I wanted three days off to go deer hunting that year. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I asked the boss, and the boss said, we're too busy, you can't take off. He said, I got ticked off, I got over, fixed to cut a tree. And he said, I just, I'm out of here. He read us off, threw it down, it was gonna turn around. It hit a stump, flipped back over, and hit his right foot before he flipped out of the way.